Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. This is Anthony. And this is James. And we're finally, finally doing Silence of the Lambs, which is one of the greatest films ever made in the history of cinema. This is number 21 on IMDb's all-time rating list. It's 96% Rotten Tomatoes. Written, I mean, directed by Jonathan Demme, released in 1991, based on the novel by Thomas Harris. Ted Talley did the screenplay. A young FBI cadet must receive the help of an incarcerated and manipulative cannibal killer to help catch another serial killer, a madman who skins his victims. Not alive. I don't know why I continue that <laughs> sentence. Skins his victims. End, end sentence. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. This really is one of my favorite films. I've seen it many times, and it still just gets better every time I see it. I watched it again just to prep for this episode, even though I didn't have to because I, I know it so well. But still, no matter how many times I watch it, I am still just like so enthralled by it. Once it gets going, I am just in it. And it doesn't matter how often I've seen it, I still adore it. And you know, a lot of people say like there are so many great movies and like people are always listing off movies as the best ever, or some of the best ever, but Silence of the Limbs, it has everything that a, a masterpiece should have. It has you know perfect directing from Jonathan Demme, who's one of my favorite directors. Two of the best performances by a lead actor and actress in history paired up in the same movie which is also super rare from Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins. And also the story is just unbelievably intense, really gritty, a, a great serial killer thriller. And everything about this film, Howard Shore's score is remarkable. And, you know, it has everything that a great film needs. Yeah, and this movie, it feels so real. Like when you watch it, it feels like you can smell it, like it, you can you can hear the, everything. It feels, like, it feels like Hannibal Lecter is alive in the real world. That's how, like intensely well made this film is and it's a horror film but it's essentially also at heart an excellent police procedural and oh, oh yeah definitely it's also a great book adaptation to film that ad book to film adaptation and you know 30 years later after this came out it's been 30 years it's still a masterpiece it swept the big five awards at the oscars it won best picture best director best actress best actor and best screenplay and only two other films have done that it happened one night in 1934 and one flew over the cuckoo's nest in 1975 and i feel like when people like you said talk about what the best films ever made i never really see Sons of the lambs on people's lists N neither do i and i mean 21 is definitely a respectable number on the imdb list so obviously the general public understands how great it is, but I agree. You you often see the same kinds of movies on like greatest films ever list, and you don't often see Silence of the Lambs on it too much. But I think that people who understand film and history, they really see how monumental a film this was in terms of its artistic integrity, how uh, uh, incredible the filmmaking is, how like there this genre is full of movies that have tried to do what Silence of the Lambs did. You know the serial killer drama. The psychological drama, the, the trying to catch a killer, you know, police procedural, FBI, so many different things put into it. And the thing about Silence of the Lambs is like how you said how you, you there's just something different about it. Like you said, like you can smell it you, or you feel like it. The filmmaking and the acting, it does something that other films don't. It's There's this other tangible the, the quality. Tangi yeah, tangible. Like you can sense things and you feel like you're in the room with the characters, even if you watch it on your phone. You know what I mean? And there's something special about this movie that no other film has even tried to been able to capture. Like Seven is a really excellent, excellent serial killer film. It's one of my favorites. But I still think that doesn't even come close to Silence of the Lambs. No, I agree. And before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost podcast is to share us with your family and friends and to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost podcast. Patron get, patrons get perks like personalized videos, podcast schedules, top tier patrons get a monthly shout out on the podcast. And the best perk of all is every patron has access to weekly bonus episodes of the show that only patrons can see. Post them on every Wednesday. Head on over to our website, RaidersOfTheLostPodcast.com to check out all of our content sources, see all of our custom merch for the show, for hoodies, t-shirts, everything. We got it all. Custom movie posters. Follow, subscribe, hit the notification bell wherever you're tuning in and listening and watching around the world. Thanks so much. And now I think the problem that some people might have with Silence of the Lambs is even though they know it's such a well-made movie, I think the, the content of it and the dark nature behind it and the serial killer aspect is so sinister and so evil. Even in 1991, is probably a little ahead of its time. I mean, now we've all been desensitized yeah. to serial killers and stuff like that, but still, it's 
just after the 80s and you know it's a very dark film especially when we're following buffalo bill around and seeing his his lair and his, his labyrinth of of haunted horrors in his basement and and just the things that you'll see people do because even though this also is essentially like a spiritual sequel to manhunter which came out in the 80s which is like the original story which is also remade into red dragon yeah but um, it's different book though. Different book, different yeah. actors, different different dragons. But it's, you could say it's a spiritual sequel. Oh yeah, definitely. But um, even that wasn't as dark as this film. And the thing is, the '80s they had it had plenty of dark, graphic nature kinds of films, whether it be like horror films or like Brian De Palma was really pushing the envelope with his movies. I mean, yeah, look at Scarface. Yeah, but even other his other like sex horror films that he was making. But a lot of those films they didn't have that big of audiences you know what I mean? it wasn't the mainstream general public were watching these kinds of movies you know they were b horror shock horror and then the palma 80s weird movies but silence of the lambs was one of the highest grossing movies that year this is when the general public saw this movie everyone saw it and it was really pushing the envelope in terms of the graphic nature um it, it was disturbing at this time because you know it's still not that long after psycho showed the um a person being stabbed for the first time you know what i mean it's not that many years after that so uh audiences are still at this point they're still evolving with movies movies are evolving with the audience and show and pushing the envelope more getting darker getting more graphic getting more visceral and real with the violence and the graphic nature of whatever it is whether it be you know someone being abused uh, sex or violence and this is a movie that really made a big step forward in terms of mainstream audiences being exposed to graphic nature. Yeah, and it's not that there's a ton of gore in this film. The majority of the gore in this movie is actually, you could say, from photographs, from off evidence. Screen. Yeah. Or, or obviously the, the corner morgue scene, that's pretty graphic, but there's just subtle things here and there, but I think it's more of the tone and the behavior of Buffalo Bill that was so disturbing but, to people. But that's the brilliance of this movie, because you can have, like, torture porn in the 2000s like hostile and you know cabin fever and all in saw and you're seeing like real gore like blood and guts and stuff but silence of the lambs you could say is scarier than any of those movies and you don't actually see too much like physical gore like the like take for example the scene when he escapes from his prison transfer holding cell it's one of the most disturbing movie moments of movie history it's terrifying when he kills those two guards well kills the first one but what happens is he, is he bites the first one's cheek but they don't show it. They just cut. It's like Anthony Hopkins, the back of his head, and then the guard facing us. You don't actually see him biting. And then when he beats the other guard re it, repeatedly, there's blood splattering on Anthony Hopkins' face. But you're not seeing him actually bash the guy's head in. But you can say that is much more disturbing than actually like seeing it th that you'll see nowadays where you'll actually see the impact. You know yeah, what I mean? I think watching... Hannibal Lecter's expression during yeah. that moment is probably the most terrifying part exactly. of the entire movie. You know, that's really what it is. That's directing right yeah. there. That's and, great directing. Yeah, speaking of when you said that this is a hit, on a $19 million budget, this film grossed $272 million worldwide. It was an international hit. It made about $140 million outside of the U.S. and Canada. So this was huge in Europe and yeah. everywhere else. That's about $600 million if it came out now. So that's massive. It's huge for, for a movie like this. For a horror film. Yeah. You know, of a serial killer in 1991. That yeah. is killing. Yeah, exactly. And so the, the, this is actually like a, a time in movies that you don't really see it anymore where, you know, the biggest movies of the years were movies like this and they it wasn't blockbusters it wasn't you know transformers it wasn't marvel it wasn't dc it wasn't star wars or disney so i i really do miss this era of film where you know the movies that everybody was seeing were actually really mature uh, really interesting and, in, and intriguing films whether in very um very different stories from one another you know what i mean it wasn't always the same thing over and over again and so i actually really miss this period of film yeah if this came out today it'd probably make like 30 million dollars at the yeah. block bus at the box office yeah probably some awards that's about it but you know it's a huge success and jonathan demi amazing directing i'm so glad you brought up howard shore because his 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 music in this film it's so engro engrossing it's incredible and even lack of yeah it's just brilliantly used and then also editor craig mckay Phenomenal job. This movie is really, really well edited because there's a lot of very long scenes and mm -hmm. and then the way he splices in the, like the sort of almost POV shots looking directly into camera, which Jonathan Demi got looking like just off lens and just it looks like you're in the room with people. So what Jonathan Demi does, well, actually, first, I want to talk about the editing because you brought it up real quick. And I think this is one of the best edited movies ever because not only does he do a brilliant job of editing these long dialogue heavy scenes, 
making the tension even more palpable and building the suspense as the scenes go on. But also the scene cutting in this film is probably some of the best of all time. And I'm talking about like a transition from one scene to another. And it's really simple stuff, but like there's moments where the cutting is just, it improves the movie where, for example, like when Lecter and Clarice are talking and he mentions that you, you're going to want to hurry up because Bill is no, no doubt searching for his next lady to take. And then he cuts to the kidnapping scene of Bill. You know what I mean? So you're talking about a character, building the suspense of him, and then we cut to him right away. And then another one where uh, they she goes to see those experts of the insect experts and the guys with the moth. And, and, the, and the, doc, the doctor, the PhD doctor says they're actually called entomologists. Oh, thank you. I, gotcha. uh, that's a complicated name. I'm not, I'm not going to remember that. I'm just calling them the moth guys. <laughs> moth guys. And the moth guy number one says, <laughs> he's talking about the moth, the, the moth and saying that somebody loved it and blah, 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 fed it honey, kept it warm. And then we cut, right after that, we cut to, we're inside Bill's basement and there are hundreds of moths everywhere, all over the walls, flying around, buzzing all over the place. Really terrifying, but that cut is so powerful, very simple. And then the most infamous cut, one of the greatest cuts of all time, is the cross cutting at the climax when the SWAT raid is knocking on the door of that house. Bill is Buffalo Bill is hearing the door the doorbell ring in the basement. Well, they're, yeah, they're ringing the doorbell. Yeah, I'm sorry, ring, ringing the doorbell. He's seeing the doorbell being rung from inside the basement, and Clarice. And then he opens the door, and then Clarice is there. So he this brilliant cutting of making us think that the SWAT team is going to raid on Biff, Buffalo Bill's home, and we actually see it's Clarice is there. Really brilliant cut of editing. Yeah. So tons of awesome technical stuff about this film. That yeah. We'll get into more and more. In terms of the eyes, we'll get to now. So we'll get yeah. So Anthony must talk about it now. <laughs> I guess I guess we're gonna do that now because <laughs> you already brought it up. <laughs> so Demi is famous for he likes to have his actors look directly into the lens. This makes the audience develop a connection with either the character or the person they're looking at. And so in this film in particular, the lead the other co-stars of the film are looking into the lens. So it, it could be Crawford, um, Dr. Shilton, it can be Lecter. They're all generally, not all of their shots, but oftentimes they're looking into the lens and it's when they're talking to Clarice. And then Jodie Foster, in contrast, she's looking almost into lens, but it's just off the camera, just off the lens. Now, what this does is it makes us form a bond and kind of like an, audi an audience relationship with Jodie Foster because the characters are looking at her. They're also looking at us. And then she's not looking at us because we're with her. So they, it's a really brilliant technique of making us connected to a character without even, but just from a technical camera technique. It's amazing. It works so well in this yeah. movie. And speaking of Jodie Foster, she plays Clarice Starling, who is clearly a fish out of water in this world. She is an FBI cadet who is very intelligent, hugely talented, has a very bright future, but she's very young. She's very inexperienced. She's still a student, but she's one of the top of her class. And Jack Crawford, who is her supervisor, who is also uh, one of the people in charge of the behavioral science service of the FBI, has her, his eye on her for a project. And the thing with Jodie Foster's character, Clarice, in this film, she has a dark past, and that kind of coincides with her inexperience for what's going on with her in, in Hannibal Lecter. And throughout this entire film, her character, Clarice, is constantly being basically demeaned by many male characters in this film. She's constantly being put down. People don't believe in her. Really, just Jack Crawford's the only male character in this entire movie, you could say, who actually believes in Clarice Starling. And also, she's constantly getting hit on by different characters, whether it be Chilton in, the, or in her first encounter at the asylum to meet up with Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, or he later, asks if she, if she um, wants to go out with him tonight. Or even later on with the uh, the Mothman. Yeah. One of the Moth guys hits on her, and she yeah. takes it as, a, as innocently. A, innocently because he's obviously got no chance with her. Yeah. But um, it's, it's such a, a great depiction of you know, a, a glass ceiling that many women were faced with in this world, in this era. And also, you could, I would say a Crawford even flirts with her, for sure. You can tell he has some like, sort of feelings yeah, for her. Yeah, I mean, the way he just, like, puts his arms up, like, like this confident manner, it doesn't seem very professional. And the handshake at the end is very intimate. Exactly. And so Clarice is a, a woman who's in a man's world at this point. And, you know, the, fil uh, the filmmakers, the cinematographer, and Jonathan Demme, they translate this visually with, with just si simple camera techniques. Like, for example... That shot in the opening when she's going to see Crawford and she's on the elevator and the elevator doors open and she's surrounded by like five men who are like a ten of them, a dozen, yeah, and they're all at least a foot taller than her and they just tower over her 
And they also put the camera up high, so it's a low, uh, your lowered angle, so it makes her look even smaller. And they're all just eyeballing her as she gets exactly. on the elevator, like, what's she doing here? And the same thing happens at the during the wake of that girl when all the deputies are in that waiting room. Well, it's the morgue, the coroner's office. So. No, it's the wake, because well, the, the wake's going on. Yeah, upstairs, but they're inside, like, the morgue area. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying during the wake. Gotcha. <laughs> That's why I said during the wake. I got this. And um, all of the men also, again, same kind of shot, up high looking down at her and the men look gigantic compared to her and oftentimes they're all just like glaring at her even inside the morgue room when she's trying to get them to leave they're all just like eyeballing her like why is this woman talking to us you know what i mean yeah and even right before then so it's the wake that they walk into but i think the wake's for somebody else because it's not for the woman that just got killed i think you're right it's just a wake that reminds her of her but there's, father's a, there's a morgue in a coroner's yeah. office and probably downstairs in the yeah basement. it's all the same structure um that's what funeral homes are a lot of they're usually both combined into one. They're like two for one, get it all done <laughs> in the same place. But um, there's a scene right when they're about to go down and they enter the wake and all these sheriffs are kind of like, the sheriff is like, why is this woman here? And even Jack Crawford, he says to the, to the guy, to the sheriff, we shouldn't talk about this in front of a woman. He's obviously doing this to get rid of the sheriff, to get him out of the hair, to let her, you know, come in eventually. He's not really meaning it. He obviously believes in Clarice completely, but Starling makes an excellent point in the car ride afterwards that people look up to the FBI and especially Jack Crawford for how to uh, how to act. Cops look to you for influence and you still shouldn't talk to women like that. And and so it matters to everybody, even if you think do something that like that just to manipulate somebody else. Exactly. And then so Clarice is a very fascinating and complex character and how she looks in and being a woman is essential to her who she is because so clarice she's small she's a she's a she's a woman she's not as physically strong as the other recruits at the at the fbi um most of them for the most part by far are tall strong men you know, very masculine world to be in the law enforcement and so because she doesn't have that strong physicality she tries to make up for it by you know being intelligent and by trying to make herself useful she doesn't even have to try. She's very intelligent. Exactly. And then also in terms of always being hit on by men, uh, there's th those three instances for sure. The way that she shields herself from that is with professionalism. She's always very polite. She's always extremely professional. She always even she t t uh, calls Dr. Chilton, sir. You know what I mean? She's always using professional mannerisms to keep a distance between men, to keep them from keep broach to, to continue broaching and continue trying. So if she if she just expresses just flat flat professionalism, it might make them let off eventually. But she's also really intelligent, where she can use it to her advantage. For example, when she first goes to visit Hannibal Lecter, and she convinces Chilton to go in, let her go in by herself because he wants to escort her and be there the whole time. And this is right after she turned down his proposal to go out. Where are they in Chicago for the night? Yeah, within thirty seconds. And um, and so instead. In order to let her, in order to let him see he Lecter alone, she manipulates him by s fake flirting with him to be like, "Oh, you, well, you should have told me this when we were in the office." And she's like, "Well, it would have not had the pleasure of your company this whole time." He's yeah. like, "All right, yeah. fine, you can go over there by her, your own." So she she knows when to turn it on for her advantage. Exactly, and she she makes an amazing hero in this story in particular because. You know, Clarice is just like the girls who are the victims of both Lecter and Buffalo Bill. You know, she's just just like another one of those girls. And that's why when she ends up being the hero of the story, it's very cathartic and it's very satisfying for the audience because and for the character because she took down these this monster who has been taking down, who has been killing and mutilating women who are just like her. You know what I mean? She so actually did it on her own too. Exactly. By herself. So... It's like turning the victim into the person who oppresses in a way and, and dominates, you know what I mean? So it's essential that Clarice is the one who winds up becoming the hero by the end of this film. And her being a woman and looking the way she does, she's the reason why, one of the main reasons why Jack Crawford chooses her to go after Lecter. Not only because she's top of her class intelligence-wise, because he's trying to entice Lecter to communicate with somebody by sending a young, beautiful woman who's also very intelligent, to go talk to him. Maybe this will get his flame going and be able... So now they can try to analyze him to get some sort of profile built around Buffalo Bill and who that man could be. Yeah, and Lecter ends up becoming very fascinated by her. 
even within a couple minutes of speaking with her, so much so that they he even develops that quid pro quo deal where he will reveal information that he has learned about Buffalo Bill in order to learn about her past and her past trauma because he's so fascinated with understanding her, her psyche, and her her story that he'll even give up what they what he would deem as valuable information in order in order to hear it from her. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about some other characters before we get too into Lecter because yeah, it's gonna spend, be a, we're going to spend a lot of time on him. So Jack Crawford, played by Scott Glenn, who's been in a ton of great movies. You might recognize him from Training Day. He's uh, Alonzo's buddy that he shoots up with the shotgun with the, the money the, he's the hiding story, on the floor. The snail floor story. Um, he's a FBI. So he's the head of the, I don't know if he's the head of the behavioral science service. I believe he is. But he's one of the head agents yeah. there. And so this is basically a segment of the FBI. This is early on in the terms of. Think of Mindhunter. FBI profiling yeah. for homicides using serial killers. And this is like early stages of where they're interviewing serial killers to try to help build profiles of current serial killers and active serial killers to try to catch them and help solve unsolved cases. Yeah. And at this point in the story, Crawford. And his department, they've basically reached the end of the line with Lecter. He, he refuses to talk with any of them anymore. You can tell that they've had a, a long history where Crawford has been trying to get to Lecter, trying to get him to aid them in their investigations, but Lecter doesn't want anything to do with them anymore. And so this is why um, this is why Crawford has turned to, to Clarice to try and throw a wild card into the mix, essentially. Yeah, and so he's also, he Clarice doesn't, well, Clarice knows it, but Lecter doesn't know it yet fully that, they're trying to use him to get to Buffalo Bill, and that's because Jack Crawford's in charge of the Buffalo Bill case. And Crawford's a, also a very intelligent person. I think what he does when Clarice goes to his office is he purposely steps out of the office so that when she shows up, she sees all the evidence photos of all the victims and all the mutilations that have happened to them to help motivate Clarice to take on this job and get her prepared for what she's going to be walking into. And also when he sends Clarice in to see Lecter for the first time, he doesn't give her a real assignment. He just says, I need you to learn from him, see how he's doing, and then hey, can he answer this questionnaire? He doesn't reveal what he really needs Lecter for because he knew that if she had walked in with uh, uh, an assignment, Lecter would have tore it apart and then become a blank wall, wouldn't have given him anything. And manipulated her with yeah. it. And then we have Dr. Chilton. And so he is basically in charge of Hannibal Lecter's imprisonment you could say he's the psychiatrist that's been assigned to him and he treats lector like a prized collectible and he says he's his most prized asset from a psychological research standpoint he and again he also hits on starling and this guy is obviously you can tell so full of himself so conceited narcissistic um arrogant loves, he, he loves the spotlight loves yeah. the attention and he seems to be overpowerful and, and he wants more power at the same time. Yeah, and he likes to torment Lecter, like for example, uh, making that gospel, playing that gospel um, show over and over again on repeat with the music, with the volume very loud. And what's interesting is Lecter, he gains sympathy from Clarice a little bit by kind of acting like a victim to Dr. Chilton. You know what I mean? 100%. He, he, he pokes these, he makes these little tiny no notions, little mentions and it kind of adds a little bit of like, oh, I got to get away from Dr. Chilton. I'll do anything to get away from him. It's yeah. very smart it's by him. very intelligent. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. Exactly. And should we get into the big boy Hannibal Lecter? I think we should do Buffalo Bill first. All right, let's do Buffalo yeah. Bill first. So Buffalo Bill is the active serial killer, and he's skinned five women so far. That's what the newspapers always say, and he hasn't had his sixth victim yet. Uh, but his next victim that he does catch is the senator's daughter. And Buffalo Bill is a very disturbing serial killer and there's a I think there's a large misconception yep. about who he is and what his identity is about so the misconception is that Bill is a transgender where people think that that's he think I think people Pe assume so, yeah people look at this movie like oh it portrays a transgender person in a horrible light as so a serial killer yeah exactly which is completely far from the truth it's totally debunked in the film by Hannibal Lecter Hannibal Lecter says that he is having a major identity crisis but he and he thinks he's transgender, but he's not. Be, but in this identity crisis, he's latching on to the idea that he's transgender, and because he covets the woman that he's sur he's surrounded with, and that's why he's, he chooses these victims. So, we just want to make a very clear distinction: the film and Lecter both point out that he's not transgender; he just thinks he is. And he's he's even tried to change in the past with different ways. And and the the moth is a symbol of him. You know, the moth a moth symbolizes change. 
And in a way, Buffalo Bill is trying to go through his own metamorphosis, his own metamorphosis, his own transformation. And so the moth is very suitable to his character as a parallel and a metaphor to him. And I think that Buffalo Bill is really, really terrific serial killer character. And if it weren't for Lecter really stealing the spotlight in this movie, I think Buffalo Bill would be considered one of the best movie villains of all time. But because Anthony Hopkins was so brilliant, he kind of overshadowed what Ted Levine did. And it's he's always kind of been in Lecter's shadow in this film. Yeah, I totally agree. And again, this film so feels so real that people think that this is based on a true story. They think Buffalo Bill was a real serial killer because it's such an iconic character. When I was a kid, I thought Buffalo Bill was a real guy. Same. Honestly. And it's real. from this movie. And so chilling, terrifying, horrible serial killer Buffalo Bill. But now let's get to the star of the movie. Before we get to him. Now, Hannibal Lecter is one of the most terrifying characters ever put into film and Anthony Hopkins does a masterful performance it's some of the best acting you'll ever see in film history and I think what he's on camera for 14 26. minutes 26 minutes yeah. yeah it's way more than 14 I don't know where I heard of that <laughs> and the role is it just seems like he's in so much more because he's so incredible mm -hmm. and he's also one of the most intelligent characters I've ever seen in a movie too as well as the most insane and he's genius he's also very playful he's articulate incredibly smart again has clearly a photopath uh, uh photographic memory uh he he can draw the duomo in, in florence il duomo from memory yeah perfect detail, photorealistic which is incredible yeah. and i just love how he just analyzes starling in seconds and manipulates her and he's basically kind of manipulating everyone around him even though he's stuck inside the cell and hannibal lecter has been portrayed many times by now and he's definitely one of the most loved in famous characters in modern fiction and in cinema. But I think in all the other actors have done a, a really terrific job with it. I think Mads Mikkelsen is the second best and Brian Cox did a really great job with Mindhunter. But what Anthony Hopkins did was really special. And when you when you talk about greatest, villain, greatest villains of all time, Anthony Hopkins as Lecter is always near the top, if not the top of everyone's list. And it's because of his performance. And you know what I also like about Lecter, aside from his, his high intellect, is his high levels of perception. In a lot of ways, he reminds me of Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, he can recognize scents like he recognizes uh, uh, Clarice's perfume. He knows that lotion. She, he, she uses... Uh, no, he... Oh, yeah. Is both. it perfume? No, it's both. Let me talk. Heavy on lotion. <laughs> so he, he, he recognizes the perfume, but she's not wearing it today. And, but she is wearing the Avion lotion today. So he recognizes those two scents. Sorry about and, that. And he even recognizes the scent that she's not wearing today because he can probably smell it on her clothes. And also... The moment when we first see Lecter and there, there's that camera, it's on the dolly and then it, pan, it it tracks over and then Lecter's just standing there alert waiting for waiting for her. It's because he smelled her down the hallway so he, he got ready and stood up for her. To because he her. had no idea what was coming. He probably obviously heard the heels and then yeah. smelt her and he's like, oh, there's a woman coming to see me. Exactly. And then he also is extremely perceptive of, about the way she speaks. He recognizes her West Virginia accent almost immediately and he has a photographic memory like you said he can read very quickly he reads her her license in an instant and says this expires in a week <laughs> but also what i really like is his uh, his perception just by visually seeing her like what because when he asked for her identification he said he asked her to come closer closer, closer. <laughs> but when she walks right up to the glass he's not even looking at the id he's looking at her face because he's he's looking at her like sherlock holmes would look at someone like seeing through them and then he glances at her badge and sees that it's out of date. So he's an unbelievable way of perceiving people. Like he he goes on that southern accent um, basic summary of Clarice's life. And he's pretty spot on with it to the point where Clarice is extremely affected by everything he said. Yeah, and when she leaves the, the hospital, the asylum, the prison, and she looks at her car, she breaks down because he was right about everything about her past. And how she's one generation generation away from white trash and all this stuff. And so he's he's very perceptive, but also Lecter. I think he's more intelligent than most people even think when they watch this movie. Because whenever I watch this movie, I like to look at his entire relationship of him and Lecter and Starling. As soon as he sees her and meets her, he looks at her as a chance to escape. And that's I think why he's always so playful and so happy because he seems like oh I'm gonna get out of here this is gonna be great and I believe the moment he sees her he views Starling as his key out especially the fact that she's inexperienced and that she's a student but also that she's very intelligent so he thinks that she'll be able to maybe help the FBI figure out who Buffalo Bill is but at the same time he's working 
a plan in his head, I believe, from this moment that I'm going to get out of here. So does, for example, does he really like her? I think he does, probably. I think but, he really is fascinating. But I think it's also irrelevant for his goals of what he's using Starling for. And I think that throughout the entire film, Lecter is playing a part and staying three steps ahead of everybody, staying a step ahead of the FBI, staying ahead of Chilton, staying ahead of the senator. I believe ne Lecter never gets caught off guard, even though he gives off the impression that he's been duped by the FBI when they give him that fake deal to get to Plum Island or Anthrax yeah. Island, really. I think he's playing ignorant so that he gets that real deal through through the senator and through Chilton, which leads to his possibility of an escape once he gets taken out of that jail cell. So I think it's the transfer he wants. Everything he's doing with Clarice and the FBI and all these games he's playing, it's to get the opportunity to escape. He doesn't care about an island or, or spending his days in some more idyllic prison. That's all a scheme. It's all about the transfer because he knows that the only chance he ever has of escape in custody is during a transfer. It's the only time when the 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 prison isn't around. He's not inside of a prison, so it's his best opportunity. But I'm really glad you pointed that out because I think the first instance where the audience is alerted to him having a plan, I think he develops his plan almost immediately, is when when she noted when she notices the the hand drawing of the Duomo in Florence. She says, you sketched that from memory, and he said, in here, all I have is my memory. I don't have a view. So that's the very first little seed because then when he he's making the deal with Clarice, he tells her, I want a room with a view. It's, it's alluding to the first conversation they had, and it's like making an emotional connection with her to that drawing he made. She can kind of sympathize with... Oh, he he wishes he could actually see something except for a, for a wall. So you kind of... She gets a small hint of empathy for him to help him make that deal happen. And it's all set up from that from her noticing that first drawing. And you don't think that a super genius like Hannibal Lecter who can draw El Duomo, a very complicated cathedral from memory to almost near perfection, de perfect detail, can't plan this plan out ahead in advance in a couple minutes right here in this jail cell? I think he predict predicts the entire thing probably. Yeah, and, he, and he's such a great manipulator because he, he manipulates the authorities by, because he's such an expert, he leads them on this false trail of giving them false leads, especially um, Lewis Friend, which ends up being an anagram, although Clarice eventually solves that anagram pretty quickly, knows that she's he's just messing with the FBI, messing with the governor. And he has this whole plan where he's not giving them anything useful, but it distracts them long enough for him to make the transfer, to make them think that they're on the right track of Buffalo Bill, and then eventually agree to the transfer and put him in that building. Yeah, so I think the first little breadcrumb that he gives to them is Hester Moffat, which is yeah. an anagram that, that she finds out, which means the rest of me. And it's in this storage facility that she deduces from his conversation that that's where this clue is leading her, where it's the, the what is it, yourself storage? Yeah, yourself in Baltimore. And then um, it, it's a cool scene because we find out that Lecter or someone prepaid 10 years of storage time here and it hasn't been opened in eight years, which is how long Lecter's been locked up. And it's a terrifying scene when, when Clarice goes in there by herself and it's very dark and spooky. There's all this odd stuff. There's like an old 50s car in there. And that's where she finds that head. And so the head, Hannibal Lecter tells her, was the victim. He found a murdered person. He found that person dead. It was an old... Um, referred patient of his who he says what had a relationship with Buffalo Bill whether we know that to be true or not we don't fully know but I think we can assume it really might be because I don't know I, I believe that Lecter has never met Buffalo it's Bill. yeah maybe I, it's all a scheme because he deleted all the records of everyone he killed and I believe that Lecter killed that person for sure and he's leading the authorities on a false trail because he says that uh, uh, Buffalo Bill was a patient of his. Uh, they had three sessions together, and then he never saw him again. But this is all a lie. Everything's a lie about Buffalo Bill. I'll help you catch him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he can perceive elements which drive Buffalo Bill, his motivations, based upon the case file. He understands Buffalo Bill because he's such a uh, high intellect. He definitely can help them in that process, but ultimately, I don't think that Lecter has ever met Buffalo Bill in person, and I don't see how they could have met in the past. Yeah, you're probably right. And so he he then offers Clarice a psychological profile of Buffalo Bill based on the case evidence for a new prison 
location, you know, a prison with a view. And also, I think we see more of Hector Lecter's intelligence when he's able to just have a convert, like manipulate someone verbally, Migs, the, the, yeah. the patient that's next to him in the jail cell next to him. He convinces Migs to kill himself just by whispering to him overnight. And it's actually interesting where when Clarice is leaving Lecter for the first time, Lecter doesn't really give her an option or like it's kind of closed end. It's like you're yeah. probably never going to see me again. But then Migs horrifically throws the semen onto Clarice, which you could say, which it seems that Lecter takes as a horrible offense to do to somebody. And it's like a terrible thing. And, he, and to make up for what Migs did, he gives her the information to proceed with her with a clue. And also he kills Migs basically by convincing him to do it himself. You could even ex believe that he probably had Migs do that on purpose. Maybe. To create the entire situation of pretending to empathize with Clarice in yeah. that moment. Actually, you're probably right because we're talking about he's manipulated this entire thing. Yeah. And it, I it's, guarantee it's he pretty... planned that whole from the, from it's the start. It's possible. I do not put it against Hannibal Lecter who is probably, again, one of the most intelligent people we've ever seen on film and as I, a character. I love the look of Lecter and what's really cool is Anthony Hopkins was very involved in the look, and, and he changed certain things. So especially uh, that suit that he wears in the prison. So it's just a blue jumpsuit, right? But originally, like, the costume designer, it was it was just going to be very baggy and just, like, wouldn't fit him properly. You know, it's, they only have so many sizes, and you just fit into this one. But Can I guess? Did you get it tailored? Yeah, so <laughs> Anthony Hopkins was like, no, Lecter would want to get that tailored, and that, that jumpsuit should fit him perfectly. And so when you look at his jumpsuit compared to the other prisoners or any other prison um, member you've seen in a movie, uh, his is perfectly suited to his body. It's perfectly, it's a perfect fit for him because that's what the character is. Because even even though he's in prison, he looks sharp. He wants to look great. You know what I mean? It's it's an amazing character trait for him. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah. I, that's always something I've thought about but never actually yeah. like looked up. And Anthony Hopkins, he got he says that. Once he got the script and read the character, the voice came to him almost instantly. Mm -hmm. That very specific voice. Every Hannibal actor has done something different. I would say Mads has just done his his natural accent. Uh, Brian Cox did a British accent, uh, even though Lecter, I believe, is from Baltimore. And then there's the Hannibal Rising movie. I believe he was a German actor or a French actor. And that movie, don't watch it. It's, not, it's, not, it's, it's <laughs> Hannibal Origins. It's dumb. They make him out to be like a victim. I couldn't believe it. But... There's something so strange about Anthony Hopkins' voice in this, that high tone, the way he speaks, the mannerism. It's like when you hear him speak for the first time, it's just shock. You've never heard anyone speak like that in your life. It's like he's not human. It's exactly. like he's an animal. Yeah, exactly. It's so unnatural and unhinged, and it really gets under your skin. He's a monster, like Chilton says yeah, in his first line. Jodie Foster said that when they did their first table read, he, she and Hopkins, they had just like done pleasantries beforehand like oh hi they'll introduce themselves and then they did the table read and she said that once anthony hopkins went into his first monologue she was like disturbed to the bone and she was even scared to talk to him on set because he was so terrifying and he would even like mess with the camera crew where if like a, a like a part like a grip or so, uh, someone helping the dp would walk into his cell he would be like what are you doing in my cell <laughs> <laughs> but lecter's so terrifying because he's so polite he's so eloquent and articulate and well-mannered he seems and he loves to converse but he can also snap into a monster in a moment and like does that hissing monster voice to to Clarice because Clarice tries to challenge her. He's like, the last person who tested me, I ate their liver with fava beans and a nice Chianti. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. You can it, switch it on like nothing. And this is where Demi's technique of having the actors look right into the lens really sets itself apart because when Anthony Hopkins as a lector is looking into the lens, he's piercing right into the audience and it disturbs you when the other actors are looking into the lens it, it it's it's cool and it adds like that like i mentioned earlier that connection to them but when when Hannibal Lecter does it it disturbs you and it, it's scary when he's looking right at you when you're watching the movie it's terrifying it makes you feel like you're there talking to him how about we take a moment from talking about Hannibal Lecter and head on into our intermission let's do it man how's that sound so let's begin with our movie quote competition I have one from a fan and one from me as well. So this is from Grayson. Grayson Yonts. Viddy well, little brother. Viddy well. Viddy well. Viddy well, little brother. Viddy well. Hmm. I don't got it. Clockwork Orange. Oh. Alex. Yeah. Good one. Sorry, Grayson. I and let also, you down. He did. He let you down, Grayson. This one's from me. 
Life passes most people by when they're making grand plans for it. Huh. Life passes most people by when they're making grand plans for it. Stomped again. Below. Oh, Johnny Depp. This is George. Yeah. Good one. Stumped you twice. Well, Grayson stumped you, and I stumped you. Man, I'm, I'm a mess today. <laughs> hey, you'll make up for it later on. <laughs> Here's my quote. I'm looking at your face, and I just want to smash it. I just want to effing smash it with a sledgehammer and squeeze it. You're so pretty. <laughs> oh, it threw me off. At first, I thought it was Step Brothers. Um, oh, man. It, oh, what is this? Want me to say it again? Yeah, say it again. I'm looking at your face, and I just want to smash it. I want to just effing smash it with a sledgehammer and squeeze it. You're so pretty. Oh, my God. All right, I give up. Barry and Punch Drunk Love. Oh, my God. That's a good one. Yeah. I thought it was Rob Riggle when he's screaming into uh, <laughs> yeah, Will yeah, Ferrell's at face the for Catalina the opening. Mixer. Yeah. I think it's the same opening. He's like, I, I, I don't want your face. face. I just want to punch it. I want to bash it. I want my fist to land right in your nose. There's not, nothing you can do. Is there, is there anything? Going? No, it's just, it's just, it's just your face. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Guess this movie release year. Hunger. The Steve McQueen one? Yeah. 2008. Nice. I got it. Nice. I told you to make up for it. You're right. I did. Thanks, man. <laughs> okay, here's my movie release here. American Graffiti, George Lucas's first film. 69. 73. Oh, man. It was close. It wasn't that far off. Eh. All right, um, movie pop quiz time. You actually, you said my pop quiz answer in the episode, but I'll say it this anyways. This episode? Yeah, I'll say it anyways <laughs> for everyone else to guess if they're catching on. Where does Lecter deduce Starling's accent is from, which she tries to hide? Huh. Which is West, West Virginia. Virginia. Here's my pop quiz question. What major horror film did Joseph Gordon-Levitt have a supporting role in? Ooh, J.G. Ellen, a horror film. Major horror film. Not like a little indie horror movie, like a major horror movie. A major horror movie. Yeah. Huh. Huh. What? <laughs> what? I'm trying to think is his filmography... I mean, any hints? Someone gets killed. <laughs> <laughs> a J. bunch G. of people get killed. JGL in a horror movie. Uh, I bet you I'm going to be upset when I hear it. Let's see. A major horror film. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yep, that's what I said. Not zombies. <laughs> not vampires. Um, yeah, it's definitely not possession. A zombie movie. What, what horror movie could he have been in? I don't know. Halloween H2O. He'll, he's in Halloween H two O. Yeah, man, I haven't seen that since I was like a kid. Yeah, holy crap, that got me. All right, who's our hater of the week? We got multiple, right? Yeah, we have a couple. We have some some real couple haters. Of mean haters this week. Real ones. There are a lot of testy people this week, man. I don't know what's going on. People, are, people are not in good know, moods. There's something in the water. Or they just don't like themselves, or what? Or so I posted a clip about Laura Dern. She was actually blacklisted by Hollywood because she starred as Ellen's girlfriend on the Ellen TV show. And after that, she didn't get any major roles for many years. And she actually spoke about this in an interview with Ellen on The Ellen Show. And it's obviously not talent because she's very intelligent. She's an Oscar winner. So, and then Jurassic Backyard wrote, I don't think it's true, but I guess it will get people talking on your TikTok page. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. And then uh, Brad Robb said, it could have possibly been that she was just a shitty actress. She's not. And I was like, she's an Oscar winner. You know what's funny about that first one? How it's like on your TikTok page. You're on TikTok. Yeah. You're literally browsing through TikTok and you're criticizing people who make content on TikTok. It's insane. Like, look yourself in the mirror, bro. Exactly. Like, what are you doing on the app, man? That is delusional. You think people like us are so bad. You're 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 demeaning us for making content for an app that you're addicted to. I'm yeah. sorry. It's Jeez. not my fault you're on TikTok and you don't like it. They He's clearly not really mad at us. It's something else. But then we got some fun haters. All right, let's hear him. B Boys Productions, he comment. They commented on our Squiggy episode. I'm tired of hearing and seeing the two of the same people on this podcast. That totally isn't definitely the best podcast in my podcast arsenal. Unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and then X Die Something wrote, "You didn't even mention the new Hotel Transylvania in your October movie release pod." Angry face. <laughs> Unsubscribed. <laughs> Love you guys. Kissy face. <laughs> How can we leave that one out? <laughs> and then Kale Witter wrote. 
I mean, if y'all don't dress up in Squid Game costumes for tomorrow's episode, we will all be unsubscribed. Too, they couldn't. Yeah, there's no sorry, prime Kale. shipping, man. Yeah. It's hard to get a hold of. Couldn't them. get it fast enough. The hottest costume this year. They're like hard to get a hold of. Oh, yeah, everyone's quickly. gonna be doing it this year. You can get them, but like, if you want to be Squid Game, you better order it like right now. Yeah, like, right now you're already probably too late because, fortunately, it's October 31st, so you have some time. But those are in demand this year. But we have a couple of really great costumes coming yeah, for yeah. coming your way next we, week. We just got some some stuff in the mail. So you'll be you'll you'll love it, Kale. I can't wait for you to see what we're it's gonna be really great. All right, we have some biggest supporters this episode. The first one is Desiree Gonzalez, who is an awesome patron. She's so cool. Really appreciate her support. She's you know, awesome. You're the best. Appreciate you so much. And then we have Tio Jitty, who left a great five star review. I love this podcast. I love their passion for movies and how well they work off each other. I get excited to rewatch movies. They joke about people unsubscribing, <laughs> but I'd say these guys made me subscribe. And I believe Tio's a, uh, a Patreon too. I Patre- believe so. yeah. a patron, yeah. Yeah. Tio's awesome. Thanks so much for that review. We have so many great patrons, everybody. I mean, I'm leaving my job pretty soon because of our patrons. So yeah, he's thanks. almost he's almost going to quit his job. Almost there, everybody. Hopefully, my boss isn't listening. But I'm about yeah month or two away yeah it's just the thing is like we just need a few more pay we just need more patrons to make sure us feel more comfortable if it's going it. to be paying our bills yeah exactly you know? so, so it's pretty exciting stuff it's been it's been a lot of work it's been uh 100 hour work weeks for about 16 months now and i'm very tired <laughs> <laughs> you'll be much you'll be well rested if you can Soon. get get out of that nine to five for real all right and anyways on this day in film in history October twenty first, <laughs> film and history. Like I told you, I'm, I'm very. I've been tired for like two years, guys. <laughs> October twenty first, Martha Marcy May Marlene was released in two thousand eleven. Moonlight was released in two thousand sixteen. And happy birthday to the late Carrie Fisher. You're like Al Pacino in Heat. Um, he's like, I'm gonna go home and sleep for a month. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like Pacino in that movie looks exhausted but like jacked up on caffeine yeah. or something. But in Insomnia he looks horribly oh, exhausted, yeah. yeah. But that's probably acting because yeah. he's supposed to be uh almost an insomniac in that film. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> moving on to our streaming recommendations, what you got? I recommend The Father, which Anthony Hopkins just won an Oscar for best actor for. It's it was my favorite movie of 2020. It's not free to watch yet, but it's only five bucks to rent on Amazon, or if you want to use an illegal pirating website, go ahead. But <laughs> we don't condone that. Yeah, but I mean, FBI, not, I, I can't, can't stop. The door. I can't stop Your you. podcast said to download illegal movies, <laughs> <laughs> so promoting illegal activity. But it's really a sensational film, and Anthony Hopkins, he still has it, man. He's really one of the best actors of all time, and his performance in that movie is really it absolutely devastated me i was blown away when i watched it because i was telling you to watch it i was like you gotta watch this. i always assume that o- older actors you know they maybe lose a step like clint is great but he's still he's he's lost a step his last couple yeah. of movies he's, he's still clint eastwood he's still acting on camera which is incredible for being 117 years old <laughs> 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 but like you can tell like that's a really old man he's, he's like he's like missed a step but anthony hopkins it's all his talent is all still there intact and it might be his best performance. It could be his best. It's up yeah. there with him. It really is. It's such an incredible role, especially if you know someone in your family or loved ones who have suffered from dementia or Alzheimer's. We've had a uh, a family member suffer from dementia for years, and just watching this movie really puts you in their shoes and helps you try to understand what their mind is like in that state and how incoherent it is and impossible to follow anything, really. Yeah, it's an, a really unbelievable film. I think it should have won Best Picture, but I mean, I just don't think... It was right for the that year, but I, I think re- really is the best movie that came out. That I don't year. think anyone saw it either. Uh, yeah, that's true. That, that, I'm that sure most well. voters did not watch this movie. Yeah, they should have though. Now let's get back to our episode on Silence of the Lambs. It's going great so far. Now where do we leave off? We were talking about Hannibal, right? Yeah, we we're still deep in, Le- in Hannibal. Do you have anything else you want to bring up right now for Lecter? Well, yeah, I think that I would really like to talk about um, Lecter's escape from custody. Ooh, if you want to get into that? Yeah, let's do that, and then yeah. I like that. What's really great about this film is there aren't that many scenes if you really count them out. You know, a lot of the scenes are very long. And this sequence is just, it happens about an hour into the film. Well, actually, can we set it up for how we got to this point? Set it up, bro. <laughs> so, like, we talked I'll about- I'll knock it down. Like, you we talked about earlier, the FBI and Clarice, they set up a fake deal with Lecter, which he's like, oh, yeah, of course I'll sign this deal. <laughs> I'll get that Plum Island, and I'll swim for once a week on the beach for one once hour a, a year. time. Anthrax Island. 
Um, again, like we said, I'm sure Lecter knows this is a total BS deal. So he he actually manipulates that deal to get sympathy sort of from the senator's side and say like, uh, uh, Jack Crawford and that Clarice Starlin have already yeah. lot, wasted enough time because your daughter's kidnapped. If it's only we're not too late, we'll be able to catch Buffalo Bill because now he's being able to leverage the FBI to get a deal with the senator and Chilton because the senator's daughter has been kidnapped by Buffalo Bill. And, everyone, and it's just by chance it's the senator's daughter. Yeah, it's, it's not connected. I don't know if he yeah. like planned it on no, purpose. No, it's just an accident. But um, basically, hold on. What was I just? Sorry, but, sorry. No, no, you're yeah. good, man. Hey, man, don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about. Oh, I just had his great point, but it's gone. It's like disappeared. Well, let me say something real quick. Say something real quick. But, and, and then Lecter shows how truly insane he is by making that horribly disgusting comment, asking if the senator breastfed um, Kathy. Or was it Kathy or Catherine when she was a baby? And he's like, and it's like kind of like muscle memory. You still feel it on. You still feel it, don't you? It's like so disturbing. And she's like, get this animal away from me. It is very disturbing. So anyways, I can't remember what I was going to say. So he uses that as leverage to get a real deal from Chilton and the senator, which he's going to be moved to Tennessee. And so this is basically the FBI finds out about this after Jack says they took a shot and they had to move on something. And so this is an opportunity now. This is what Lecter's been working towards. Now he has a chance. He's going to finally leave the cell. He steals that pen somehow from Chilton. And he's just waiting for the right moment to use it. Let's talk about how do you think he stole that pen? I have no goddamn idea. Because did he have to sign the contract? No. So how... The, it was left there. My guess... So my guess is his arms are bound down, right? Because they're bound, right? But, you know, his, move, his fingers can move. So my guess... But he's in the insanity jacket. So is he? I'm pretty sure he is. I, I can't... Uh, let me pull up a photo real quick. Like when he's in the... um. In the dolly, the thing with the wheels, what's that called? Maybe as they wheeled him through the cell, his fing his fingers could reach down onto the mattress and grab that pen. That's my guess. Because the pen's on the clipboard, yeah. and I don't think that Chilton picks the pen and clipboard up when he goes to get in, in Lecter's face to talk to him, right? No, he leaves it on the bed, and then Demi gets a shot of the pen on the bed. And then Lecter glances at it for a second. I think the mystery is the fun part about it. Exactly, that's true. Because it's like, how the hell could he possibly get that pen? Yeah, but then also you believe that he did. Yeah, that's. but that's my guess. It might even be possible that the pen never was even took. That he, he always had it. He had something so, else, Because in the book, he had a key that he had gotten uh, months previously, and he had been holding on to, and then during the transfer, he finally used it. So he could have gotten this, like, months or weeks beforehand. So you know, that's also it's possible that, that Demi's just kind of misleading us, exactly. and Lecter's even just looking at it like maybe just looking at the contract. Like, do I want to? No, that? he's looking at the pen. There's yeah. a reason why it's gold. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. Is it gold or is it silver? I thought it was silver. Um, it might be bronze. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, what's really cool um, about the mask? So that iconic mask. It's actually it was originally a hockey mask, so a white hockey mask, and they just carved out the top to make it the opening of the where his eyes would be exposed. And then they like painted it and scuffed it up brown and added like those little bars in between the mouth. So it was really, really originally just a hockey mask. It looks pretty fantastic. Yeah, it's it's terrifying. so iconic. Both the masks are the one that he's in the cell. That's also terrifying yeah. too. That must have been uncomfortable. They both seem really demeaning, obviously, to Lecter. But I think the first one might be more demeaning because it's just crushing his face. Yeah, but also it's like it's necessary. That's what's so terrifying about the character because when Chilton first is talking to Starling in the opening of the film and he's like we have these precautions for a reason I'm going to show you why one time he complained of chest pains and we took him into the ER section and he uh, leaped at a nurse and he did this to her face the doctors were able to reset her jaw so you can only imagine what he did to her when he's like she lost one of her eyes it's like yeah. what the hell could he have done yeah. just using his jaw to destroy this woman's face so it, these precautions are necessary and that makes the character more scary because uh, you know, a human being who needs to be bound like this, like incapable of moving a limb or their head. Muzzled like a like yeah. a ferocious dog. Like that's how dangerous he is. It's It adds so much to the character. It's amazing. All right. So, yeah, and this sets up where he, he gets a real deal and now he's being transferred. So he gets moved to a courthouse in Memphis, Tennessee, where he'll be, moving, be moved again to another prison afterwards, but he's at a temporary holding cell inside some large room there. And unfortunately, uh, Clarice has lost her sway with these people. You know, the doctor kicks her out right away because she's she clearly states that it's an anagram, the name Lewis Friend, 
and that oh, that's it, the name he gives the senator in the it, other exactly and that it is it's a scientific when she does the enneagram i can't remember what the scientific name is but it's iron full, iron false false something but it's sulfate full, iron sulfate it's fool's gold fool's gold so it's just it's a gay it's a game that in the, he's leading them on a false trail but you know no one's going to listen to her at this point but hannibal's escape from custody this sequence it's a good 20 minutes but it's so well crafted when you have you know the SWAT team coming in cut with the mystery of the person on the elevator but before all that you know when Lecter does escape and he incapacitates the guards it's really one of the most disturbing scenes ever put on film and it's so brilliant yeah but even before he takes out the guards everything leading up to it is so genius but before he actually gets visited by Clarice and they have that one conversation and Clarice is just begging for a name like help me catch her let me help me catch him you've got your transfer you've got what you want just help me catch Buffalo Bill to save her life and he's telling her everything you need is in those files, Clarice. It's all there. It's really all there, which comes into play later on. It's the only time I've you can believe him in the movie. I think yeah. it's the only time he's telling the truth. It really might be because he's gotten what he wanted. He, this yeah. is exactly where he wants to be, the chance to escape. Mm -hmm. And so I love this scene leading up to the deaths of the police officers because Lecter put some kind of obstacles in their way to slow them down in a way. So he gets handcuffed at the bars, but that's when he pulls out his pin to pick the lock. But he knows it's going to take him a little time to pick those handcuffs, you know. It's probably going to take him close to a minute. So he needs somehow, somehow and some reason to distract the police officers as they're bringing in his second dinner. Lamb chops, son of a bitch. <laughs> He's better than me. And um, what he does is he puts the drawings on the table. It's one of these little things he does. Well, and I think the first thing he does is he's playing that music and he's like, uh, just a second, just another moment. He's kind of preparing for what's about to happen. I think he's taking in the in the moment for I mean, sure. Yeah. I think he's savoring the moment. Like he's he's like it's like foreplay. I think also maybe he's getting the the pin lodged from inside of his mouth, so maybe he needs a few more, few more seconds to do it, so it doesn't look like he's doing something. Yeah, it could be that too. So then he takes it out of his mouth and gets it prepared into his hand. So I, oh, that's what I'm pretty sure that's actually what he is doing. So he's getting it out of his mouth while they're coming. And but he's hiding inside. <laughs> oh my god, that sentence! <laughs> I almost choked on that water. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. <laughs> so when they're coming in, <laughs> you're sick. You're sick, man. You're sick. <laughs> Say when they walk in. So when the police officers are walking into the cell, the drawings are purposely put on the table so that he can buy himself some more time to pick the locks on the handcuffs, and. It gives him that time to escape the handcuffs and then get the upper hand on the police officers because they're moving the drawings. And he's been polite to them. And they told him, if you're polite to us, we'll be polite to you. Yeah, he knew he knew that, like, since he's being respectful, the guard would kind of be respectful to the artwork. And also, there's something unspoken about artwork. Like, even though he's, like, a terrible person, like, you don't want to ruin this, you know, beautiful piece of art. You know what I mean? There's something of about- Clarice. Yeah, of Clarice. <laughs> and also the duo, too, but it's the like- duo? The duo. The duo. <laughs> El Duomo. El Duomo. <laughs> My God, aren't you half Italian? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, El Duomo. And <laughs> the duo. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I said Duomo like three times already. <laughs> but um, so he knew that like there's like this respect people have towards great artwork. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, I can see that. But this this moment is so terrifying because it happens so fast. He's so prepared for it. And like we mentioned earlier, the way Demi films it, you don't really see the violence happening. You don't really see gore. You don't see anything graphic happening. It's it's what's happening off camera that's so disturbing. And also watching Lecter's reaction to things. Like when the doctor earlier pointed out that when he mutilated that nurse, his um, heart rate didn't get above 85 beats per minute. And you can tell during this moment when he's bashing that guard's face in, his face is still has this calm look to it. I wouldn't say it's calm. It's but it's, he's he's enjoying it, but he's not like out of breath. You know what oh, I yeah, mean? Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, you can tell his heart rate is still low. But you can tell that he's transformed into something other than human in this moment as he's it's so odd as he's killing it. It's like it's elegant carnage. He's like does these very eloquent uh, strokes with the baton as he's bashing it into the police officer. Yeah, he just, it's like when he's listening to the music afterwards exactly. and he's waving his hand. It's like he's almost a conductor of a concert and he's just in this is the first time he's been able to kill somebody in eight years so you can tell that he's probably enjoying the hell out of it in his eyes. He, again, he doesn't look human as he's doing it. 
And also, right after this, we cut to he's listening to the music, the classical music playing on the record. And, you know, it's an overhead shot of the cell. And he's like looking up and he's just savoring the music. And then he, he almost for a second forgets the other guard is still alive because you, you can see his reaction when the guard is like groaning. You can tell he's crawling across the room. And uh, Anthony Hopkins is like, oh, oh. And then ready when you are ready when you are. And it's like he was so he's such a, a lover of art. In great art that even in this moment, you know, a, a guard could walk in and discover him. But even in this moment, he's taking the time to really savor the music. Well, you can probably assume that this is the high that he's been waiting for for eight years. So you can yeah. only imagine what's going on in his brain in, sort of, in terms of a chemical rush. And I'm sure he he always enjoys trying whenever he can to combine classical music with his killings. It seems like it. Yeah. I think he's just enjoying. He's just getting off so much, you know. Yeah. But then the escape is also genius after this where he puts the the dead body of the police officer on the top of the elevator and then he also cuts off that guy's face and puts it on his face completely and mutilates it changes so it's the unrecognizable outfits. and it's so genius when um the officers come in and they assume that Hannibal Lecter escaped and, and they can't find the other officer oh and, and then he he has the face in the, in the uniform of the other officer yeah. and i think another little genius thing that he does is when he's in the stretcher and they're wheeling him down, he pretends to have a seizure. Yeah. And I think he does this because he wants the ambulance crew and all the all the paramedics to be like, we have to get this guy to a hospital right now. Obviously, they were rushing because he was severely mutilated. But you don't want to take a closer look at him. But to, to yeah. because he's uh, he's about to die, we have to get him in the car going. So yeah. he wants to be moving as soon as possible. Because if people look closely at his wounds or even if an, an EMT is trying to like assess his wounds on his face, they would see it's clearly a uh, face put onto his own yeah so it's a that's a great point brilliant strategy by Lecter of making the emts panic themselves to rush him out immediately and get him in the ambulance and then it's great the first time you watch this you think you, you think he's on the elevator he's on the elevator and the swat team coming in it's just such great filmmaking the tension is unbelievable the elevator ticking to floor yeah. three then going up then going down it's, yeah. it's so awesome and it's so smart of not showing on what happened on top of the elevator and then when you see the blood stain on the ceiling you're like oh my god is he gonna jump down and kill them all it's unbelievable it might be the best prison escape in film history it is. I it's would like say. up like in terms of like shawshank alcatraz this one is probably the the best or most entertaining i think Shawshank is the probably maybe the biggest payoff emotionally, but this is way cooler for sure yeah, because it has the twist element too. Yeah, because it's also it's a genius plan, but then the twist because when the body falls down and the SWAT see who it is, and then it cuts to inside the ambulance, Lecter just sits up and he's about to kill that EMT inside. It's just unbelievable. What a great edit. Yeah, and the thing with Alcatraz and Shawshank, they have years and months to plan it out and prep it and do it, whereas Lecter has like 10 minutes, come up with a genius plan under the circumstances that I'm in to escape this building full yeah. of police officers. It shows you just how much on a different plane his intellect is from everyone else, where you have people who have been trained for these situations, a, a, a great tactical SWAT team, and he, his powers of deduction and intellect and, and his planning defeats them easily. And what happens after this is Lecter disappears. He's off the grid for the rest of the film, really, until the final scene of the movie, which is good. I think we need to do that to complete Starling's investigation it's, it's of Clarice's Buffalo It's Clarice's story. Bill. Yeah, because now it's all Clarice. Hannibal's out of the way. He's the most exciting part of the film. But now let's get Clarice's investigation and finishing it up. Do you want to talk about our other amazing sponsors first? Why don't we do I think that one of the greatest posters ever made is the Silence of the Lambs poster. I have it right here. If you're watching on YouTube. With you, Clarice. Yeah, with Clarice with the, the moth over her mouth. It's iconic. It's so simple, and I think it's clear, easily one of the best marketed posters of all time. If you love posters, you got to head on over to MoviePosters.com. They sent us this poster as well as all the other posters decking our set right now. Use our special promo code Raiders15 off to get 15% off your order today. MoviePosters.com has pretty much every film imaginable at their arsenal. All sorts of sizes, framing, backlighting, whatever your poster needs are, they can handle it. Again, head on over to MoviePosters.com and use our promo code Raiders15 off to get 15% off your order today. Now let's dive back into Silence of the Lambs. And there's still so much to talk about. This movie is dense and super fascinating. So I actually took the liberty 
and I made a list of Starling's entire investigation. Oh, is this the thing you were telling me yeah, about? Yeah, I was telling you about this. I was, I was really, this. really excited about it. So it's <laughs> actually 12 points of investigation that I'd like to go one by one through real quick because like we said, there's a lot of very long scenes in this movie and there's a couple different storylines going on, but I think it'll be cool to go through Starling's storyline on her own. Let's hear it. So it opens up obviously with that first meeting with Hannibal Lecter. This is just her investigation, not her scenes. And then after that, that leads her, the, the, the Moffat clue leads her to the storage facility, finds the severed head. This brings her back to Lecter again, where Lecter offers that deal with her for a psychological profile for personal information in a potential deal to be moved to a different prison. And then is the autopsy of the newly discovered victim because a few victims of Buffalo Bill have been popping up from underwater because they were weighed down. This one specifically had that moth lodged down inside of her throat, which was put there on purpose by Buffalo Bill, which was sort of a calling card. Next, her investigation leads her to the entomologists, which are the insect experts, aka moth guys. The moth guys, <laughs> and they uh, they analyze the the moth, which I think is called the death's head moth, mm -hmm. and this only lives in Asia. And like Anthony said earlier, someone loved him very much, fed him honey, kept him warm. And the next part of her investigation is back to Lecter, and this is where Starling informs Senator Martin offered Lecter a deal. So this is a fake deal that the FBI is telling Lecter. And if he accepts this, if he helps them catch Bill uh, Buffalo Bill. So he only gets this fake deal if they catch Buffalo Bill. And this is where the quid pro quo starts that Anthony talked about earlier on, where Lecter wants to be able to analyze Starling and get personal information from her and basically create his own psychological profile of her because he's interested in her. But then also once she leaves, Chilton tells Lecter that it was all a scam, offers him the real deal with the senator. And the funny thing is about this is, is we're saying that Lecter's play, playfully being ignorant to Chilton to make Chilton seem powerful and feel like he has more intelligence than Lecter. Like, how could you not see that it was a fake play? He's like, oh, yes, you're right. I'd love to sign this <laughs> other deal. <laughs> but I'm telling you, he knew it was a deal. This, oh, is also, this is also where Lecter tells him the name of Buffalo Bill is actually Lewis Friend, which is an anagram, fake name. Again, Lecter just wanted the transfer. Yeah. Um, the next part of her investigation is Lecter at the temporary cell at the Tennessee courthouse. And this is where uh, Clarice is trying to just beg for the name. And this is a really great conversation with Lecter where he's talking about it's all there. And so what does this man do? What does he fulfill? He covets. He covets what he doesn't want. And that's how she's able to deduce later on with her friend that because it's coveting, Buffalo Bill must know the victims, or at least one of them, the, the one that they're talking about. And then this is where Lecter fully analyzes her about why did you run away? And they talk about the lambs and how Clarice tried to save one of the lambs after her parents died and she was sent to live at that farm of her relatives. And she tried to run with the lamb, but she couldn't make it too far, only a couple miles. Then she was sent to a Lutheran orphanage. And L Lecter says to her, if Catherine lives, you can stop the screaming of the lambs, right, Clarice? Something like that. Nice impression. And then um, the next step of her investigation is Clarice and Ardelia are trying to figure out a clue. And this is where Ardelia is like, what did Lecter say? Simplicity. Coveting. What does she cover? This is where she says, oh, this is where they both deduce that they, she, Buffalo Bill must have known the victim, Frederica. And then... The next part of her investigation is Clarice is in Federica's home and in Frederica's bedroom. This is where she finds those sexually explicit Polaroids. And then she finds in Federica's closet the dress with the same diamond cut prints on the back of the dress that were found in the recent victim with the diamond shaped cuttings. And this is where Clarice deduces that Buffalo Bill is trying to make himself a woman's suit in that he has to be a seamstress, a tailor, someone who's very talented with a, with a needle and thread. And cr this is also when she's talking on the phone with Crawford, and Crawford's in a plane. He's like, oh, we already know. His name's Jamie Gum, Jamie, Jamie Gum John Grant. Uh, we pulled him up with Croft refer references as he was caught at customs because he was trying to import illegally the same Caterpillar's pods the same caterpillars that the death moth comes from. So they actually found the real Jamie Gums, John Grant's house, which is where the FBI is going. And then obviously we find out that he doesn't live there anymore because he went to 
the other house. So then the next step of Clarice investigation is just finishing up the interviews with Federica's associates, for example, the girl at the diner, which leads her to the Lippmans. And so she arrives at Mrs. Lippmans' old house, but finds Jack Gordon there. And he tells her that Mrs. Lippman had a son. But then obviously when she's inside the house, she sees the moths, she sees all the signs. She realizes that Gum or Jack Gordon is clearly Buffalo Bill. And then the final part of her investigation is Bill's horror labyrinth of death in the basement. Great, great summary. Thanks, pal. That clears up a lot for for the, for the entire film. Yeah. Good job. And again, going back to the lambs, Clarice is highly motivated, not just to save these girls, but you know to get to overcome her past and her trauma. And like Lecter said, he deduced that the way she sees it, and she's not sure if this will happen, but the way that he thinks that she is approaching this is if she, these lambs, the lambs are the girls. And if she can save this last girl, like she saved that last lamb, maybe she'll stop having these nightmares about her childhood. Um, but also there's that easy fear that, you know, just like the lamb was killed by the rancher, she can be killed by the serial killer, Buffalo Bill. And so she has an emotional stakes in solving this case and saving her. Yeah, and I think there's some misconception about did the FBI go to the wrong house? And so the FBI, they didn't go to the wrong house because that's where James Gunn, or who, what he calls himself, Jack Gordon, that's where he used to live. That's his old home. But he killed Mrs. Lippman and is basically squatting in her house right now. That's why that's why Clarice is looking for the Lippmans because it's not it's on record that they still live there. Mrs. Lippman still lives there. Yeah, she exactly. was a tailor. Exactly. So he was in that previous house maybe a couple of years ago because he said he... He, he lies to Clarice and said, I bought this place. He's clearly, you can tell Ted Levine did a great job. Ted Levine, of you can tell he's trying to make up what he's saying. Oh, yeah, I bought, bought, this, it, uh, bought this house two about years two ago. years ago. Yeah. So he probably came here two years ago. Great impression, by the way. <laughs> from that other house. Yeah. And so it's this is a terrifying scene because when the, the cross-cutting happens that you brought up, how the FBI think they're in the, the right house, they're both ringing the doorbell. And when they break into the house and they realize it's empty, and then Jack's like, Clarice. And then <laughs> when uh, the door opens in front of Clarice and it's Jack Gordon, as an audience member, you're like, get out of there, Clarice! Oh get out of there! Pull out your gun! And then she goes inside the house and Clarice obviously realizes that it's, it's Buffalo Bill and then he runs away downstairs. Well, so the house, des- the house design is terrific because uh, when she steps inside, it's very, um, mi- not misty, dusty in the air. You know what I mean? It's, it, it hasn't been cleaned. At all. Because he clearly just spends all his time downstairs. Exactly. And, and then she can see how much of a mess it is. As she, and then that's disturbing. And then as she keeps walking further into the home, then she sees all the tailoring tools, the sewing kit, the, the, the yarn, the string, um, all sorts of tools that a tailor or a seamstress would use. And the moths. And then the moth. That moth literally an amazing shot when the moth flies on top of the, the, the swoon of yarn. And it's just such a great image. That's such a terrifying moment. And then Jody Foster plays it so well. And then he he immediately escapes downstairs because he's not an idiot. He knows what's going on. And this leads to, I think this could be one of the scariest scenes of all. I think it could be the scariest scene of all time. Especially the first time you watch it. But even, yeah. I still watch it now with the lights off. It is still terrifying. Yeah, because she's walking into this basement and... She, you could J- Jodie Foster. I, I think she's she plays scared better than anyone ever has. Like her hands are shaking. It's like when you're really scared, you can barely move, and you're like her eyes are wide open. Like you can see how on edge she is and how terrified she is in her face and how and the her voice how how shaky it is when she's talking to her down the well. It's it's an unbelievable scene. There's so many doors in this basement and it's so dark. The lighting's amazing. Plus with the music, you, you can't tell where Buffalo Bill could be. And it's a huge basement, and there's a freaking well because, as we haven't even really talked much about Bill in terms of what he's been doing throughout the movie, like when he kidnaps that woman Catherine, which is a, it's a clever way to kidnap really, somebody, really, but brilliant. it's very terrifying because uh, he asks her, "You're about a size 14," and then he's like, "Oh, good." And then he cuts up the shirt, and this is the trademark that he does. He cuts up the blouse in the rear, and he throws it outside of the van, and then that's usually what police find to find out that somebody's been kidnapped by Buffalo Bill. But he's so obsessed with skin, and what he wants is to get um, plus size woman like Catherine or a size 14s around there, so that when he has them inside the well, this is obviously what 
Starling deduces when she's at Frederica's house in her bedroom so that he can starve them down a little bit to make their skin looser so that when he kills them, it's easier to cut and able to use this basically human fabric to create his woman's suit. Exactly. And like we mentioned earlier about him, he's trying to transform himself. And so he wants to create this suit to transform who he is and transform his identity. And again, he's not transgender. He thinks he is, and he's having this crazy, insane identity crisis. And he's trying to figure out what he is. But again, he's not transgender. He's saying bad things about transgender people. And he's turned to this because he was rejected to have surgery to change his um, sexual organs. So because he was rejected for surgery, that has turned led him to begin this crusade of taking his own skin and making himself a woman. And coveting woman. And remember, it's he's going after what he covets. In the well, it's so disturbing. And the scenes with Catherine in there, they're terrifying. And, and I think, obviously, Catherine knows she's in tremendous danger. But I think part of her thinks that maybe she'll be able to be returned home because her mother's a powerful woman. She's a, a political senator, you know, in this state. And, you know, maybe maybe they'll be able to work something out with Buffalo Bill and she'll be home. But I think the moment where she realizes she's in total doom and that she's definitely going to die is when after Bill is pulling up the, the bucket with the lotion, and the flashlight, the flashlight gets a glimpse of a clearly a bloody fingernail that's been ripped off on the side of the well from a previous victim. And she obviously sees this and realizes I'm definitely going to die. But also scratch marks yeah, on the, the wall. The scratch marks yeah, and then the, that's the, it. the bloody fingernail is attached yeah. to the scratch marks. It, exactly. Like that's that means like he's she's not the first person that's been down here. And that's really obviously the most terrifying part of that. And, you know, I think obviously it's been comedically um, homaged and, and teased like puts the lotion on its skin you know it's it's like a part of popular culture oh for sure and and it's because this it's things become a part of the zeitgeist and culture because of how powerful they are and i've obviously it's used for comedic effect mostly but it's because it started with this scene which is so disturbing and so spine tingling yeah but what i like about Catherine is she's not completely helpless because she actually formulates her own plan while she's in the well where she can say that she's the first victim to probably do something like this where she's able to kidnap buffalo bill's dog precious and she's able to kind of leverage precious uh Pretending, she, uh, well, hold on, what am I trying to say? In threatening to injure Precious. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. you talk for a long time. It's hard to get words <laughs> out sometimes. By threatening to injure Precious, she's able to buy some time, which allows Clarice to get there in time to save her life. And what's also interesting is that Bill does his best not to ever talk to her. He only gives her instructions and orders, and that's it. Like, when she's, when she's begging him and trying to plead with him, he won't. He won't respond to her. All he keeps saying is, give me the lotion or, or bring it back up. You know what I mean? He, he like tries not to look to her. He doesn't her. want to have develop a connection to her because it'll make it harder for him to kill her. So he's always keeping a distance and a, a, an emotional barrier between them. Yeah, and another really iconic scene that was huge, and it's still in the zeitgeist and pop culture, is the tr Bill's transformation scene when he's yeah. got the music on, he's putting the makeup on and the dress, and he's tucking his, his genitals inside of his legs. It's a really super memorable scene. But again, this is... This is where Bill, again, he's not transgender, but he thinks that's what he has to be. He's having an identity. He has identity disorder. Yeah. yeah that's what it is. Something intense. Associative identity, identity disorder. But that's such a terrifying scene because he's doing this and taking these photos of himself while he has a woman in a well, yeah. a room over, screaming for help. And he has the music so loud that he can't even hear her. It's terrifying. And and when Clarice is moving through the basement, it really, it really is so s sensationally terrifying especially when the lights go out and when that happens i can only i want to see this in a theater so bad i wish like the first time i saw it could have been in a theater because yeah. i can only imagine what the experience was like for an audience to when the theater goes black and you can't see anything with clarice no cell phones yeah no cell phones i'm sure the audience was on edge in every theater and then when the the what do you, night vision goggles turn on and then you just see clarice just like panicking trying she, she's like her hands are shaking she's trembling as she's trying to find you know walls or anything a piece of furniture that she can touch to help guide her as she's moving through the basement and then and bill is just enjoying watching her you know he you can tell he's just like taking in the moment like he's probably amused at her at how helpless she looks and how she can't see and he can and he has complete power in the situation yeah it's interesting because he could just 
knock her, her yeah. out. No, even, well, even pulling the the chamber yeah, back yeah, on yeah. the revolver yeah. causes her to hear it. But like he could just take the gun and smash her in the head if he wants to. But it's yeah. interesting. Like he's almost trying to touch her. Like uh, this is. I think he's looking at Clarice and seeing something he covets. Yeah. I think that's why he doesn't kill her immediately. He's like, I'm coveting this person right here. That makes total sense. I think that's his obsession is coveting woman mm -hmm. and wanting to be a woman. So maybe that's why he doesn't immediately have the intention to. I'm just gonna kill her in a second. But I want to. I want to watch her and enjoy. This this and covet her as long as I can. Yeah, he probably finds her very beautiful and just wants to enjoy looking at her. For sure. But fortunately, Clarice is a wicked shot kid. Those reflexes, man. Here's that chamber, takes him out, blows a boop, hole boop, in the window boop, boop. too. When that happens, you're like, yes! And then she shoots out the window and, and Bill's just like on the ground, like bleeding out. It's such an amazing scene. I like the death because it's it's pretty quick and... It's not a flattering shot of the of the killer. It's just like watch the, we see this guy die, but we're really looking at Starling. Yeah, yeah. You you stay with her, uh, and he does a great death. Like his hands are like twisted, and his fingers are like that. It's like that seems realistic. Like he's really dying. Like very like true to true to real life. But you know, it's Clarice that we're with, and then you see that when she realizes what she did, and that she won the situation. It's just so amazing for the audience. Yeah, and so Clarice you could say is able to put her trauma at rest here because you know the story of the lambs and the significance of the lambs in her life compared in when you compare it to Catherine in the well and these innocent women who are being slaughtered by buffalo bill she's she's truly purely motivated by protecting the innocent she tried to protect and save that lamb and that's what she's trying to do here with Catherine she's trying to protect and save Catherine and you know Catherine and the lambs are the same and she also proves herself in this male dominated world you know she she not only finds the killer but takes him down and you know she gets her agent she gets her badge she's officially an FBI agent it's like winning the super bowl for sure, making the nfl yeah, i'm sure she got a special award too or something like services to the fbi for yeah. catching buffalo bill on her own which is awesome mm -hmm. and you know that it's nice to see the celebration we have again that intimate handshake between jack crawford which i like jack never crosses the line he never yeah. like hits on her you he's, can tell he wants to but he, he doesn't he's, yeah he's definitely attracted to i think they're both attracted to each other she clearly looks up to him for sure and but also the thing is they're going to be working together because she he he reveals in their first scene together that he knows that she's been tr she wants to join the behavioral science oh, department. yes very much sir yes <laughs> oh yes yes very much sir thank you and so she, they'll be working closely together for a long period of time probably and also she gets a phone call at the end of the film dun, which dun, is dun. from dr lecter who is somewhere in some remote island and he's get, saying his his, not his final goodbye to Clarice, but just saying bye to Clarice for the moment. And I love how he says that he's not going to look for Clarice. And he's like, I hope you pay me the same courtesy. And she's like, you know, I can't do that, Dr. Lecter. <laughs> and then he, and then I love how it ends because we get to watch him start following Chilton and saying, I'm having a friend over for dinner. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And Chilton's just with his guide. He looks terrified. And I like, wish we could get a movie of just yeah. him getting, out, getting Chilton and eating Chilton. <laughs> that, that, that would it. be awesome. <laughs> How awesome would that be? <laughs> that would be great. To watch yeah. Lecter get revenge on somebody that he completely hates. Imagine it, what he did to him. He that's, probably, that's crazy. The, the, he would have tortured him. He would have taken his time. He would have really made him suffer. I bet you maybe, you know how in, in Hannibal, how he makes that one guy eat his own brain yeah. while he's still alive? Maybe he does something like that, Make like makes Chilton eat parts of his own body. Oh, man. This is getting gross. Sorry, guys. Oh, but this man. is Hannibal Lecter we're talking about. <sighs> Hannibal the Cannibal. Terrifying. The, like, imagine what he did to that guy. Oh, man. Yeah, because generally Hannibal, he preys on predators for the most part. But Clarice isn't a predator, which is why he's not going to go after Clarice. And also, he has a vendetta against children. Ch um, Chilton. Yeah, but even after he kills Chilton, why yeah. why not go after Clarice yeah. if it's going to be his... He likes Clarice. Yeah, he likes her too much. The world is far more interesting with, with you, you in it. it. There are also, in Silence of the Lambs, a lot of misconceptions in this film that are actually the Mandela effect, which is basically a phenomenon where a large group of people think something is true, which is not true at all. And so there are a few instances in Silence of the Lambs with the, where this is true. And so one of the main misconceptions is that Hannibal Lecter never says, hello, Clarice. He never says that once in this film like that. When he meets Han when Lecter and Clarice meet, he says, good morning. He never says, hello, Clarice. And also there's a misconception. Well, and he also says, good evening, Clarice. 
another time at the courthouse. Yeah. So this is the Mandela yeah. effect. He never people, says hello. People think that's part of the truth, but I'm sure you could find like a T-shirt and bumper stickers that say "Hello Clarice." Everyone post. thinks it. Yeah. yeah. So it's not actually in the film or script. even I say it sometimes. Yeah. It's just not part of the. I don't say it anymore because I'm I'm educated. <laughs> and also another uh, Mandela effect that's not true in this film is there's the assumption that Hannibal Lecter, Anthony Hopkins, doesn't blink in this film, which is completely false. Watch any of the scenes he in, he's in. He blinks plenty of times. Maybe he blinks less than a normal human because he's maybe trying to keep those blue eyes open to seem psychotic even more. But it's, the, again, the Mandela effect where people think that he doesn't blink in this movie at all, where he does. Anthony Hopkins, he actually did it on purpose. Uh, he had a friend that he grew up with who blink, who did not blink that much, and it it kind of creeped people out. So he t he took that from his friend, that character trait, and gave it to Lecter. We love this movie clearly. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Want to do some trivia? Yes, please. I would love to do some trivia. Okay. When Anthony Hopkins first got the script for Silence of the Lambs, he initially thought the film was a children's story based upon the title. <laughs> did he? <laughs> yeah. That's really funny. <laughs> In preparation for his role, Sir Anthony Hopkins studied files of serial killers. He also visited prisons and studied convicted murderers, and was even present during some court hearings concerning gruesome murderers and serial killings. The Silence of the Lambs was inspired by the real-life relationship between University of Washington criminology professor and profiler Bob Keppel and serial killer Ted Bundy. Bundy helped Keppel investigate the Green River serial killings in Washington. Bundy was executed on January 24, 1989. The Green River killings were finally solved in 2001 when Gary Ridgway was arrested on November 5, 2003 in a Seattle courtroom. Ridge Ridgway pled guilty to 48 counts of, aggra of aggravated first-degree murder. Anthony Hopkins' performance as Hannibal Lecter only took 24 minutes and 52 seconds of screen time, making it the second shortest to ever win an Academy Award for Best Actor in a Leading Role. Jodie Foster claims that during the first meeting between Dr. Hannibal Lecter and Clarice Starling, Anthony Hopkins' mocking of her southern accent was improvised on the spot. Foster's horrified reaction was genuine since she felt personally attacked. She later thanked Hopkins for generating such an honest reaction out of her. The idea to use glass in Lecter's Baltimore cell as opposed to traditional bars came from production designer Christy Zaya. The idea came about because director Jonathan Demme was unhappy shooting the Lecter scenes through bars as he felt they negated the sense of intimacy between Lecter and Starling, which he was trying to achieve. In Harris's novel, Lecter's cell did have bars but also a nylon net just behind them. That's what actually I love about the design of, because you she goes through those cells. She walks past the other cells and they all have bars, but then she gets to Lecter's cell, and it's glass, showing that he's different even from these horrible killers that yeah, are in yeah. this room. It's really fascinating. He's even on another level outside of them. It's like he's in a terrarium. Yeah, exactly. That's how dangerous. It's almost he is. like it's not a cage. Exactly. So I I love that aspect of the film. It's in he there are the the scenes where there are bars. Demi does a great job of showing intimacy, like when, like there's moments when he, Clarice and Lecter are connecting, and then Demi moves the camera through the bars until the bars are out of the frame, and it's just intense close-ups of both characters, showing that they're connected in that moment. Really great directing. But I can see why he doesn't, he found that bars on the foreground would separate them too much. That's all my fun facts for, for the... Yeah, well, we really hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Silence of the Lambs, truly one of the greatest films ever made in the history of cinema. And one of our greatest episodes, I think. I, this was a lot of fun. I recommend watching this movie. I'm sure you've all seen it. Watch it soon, then check out this podcast episode for sure, too, to coincide with it, which a lot of our fans like to do. Yeah. Or just watch it after you listen to this podcast because... I'm sure you'll get so much more out of it after listening to all this analysis. But again, thanks so much for tuning in. Be sure to become a patron today because I am quitting my job soon at Raiders of Lost Podcast. No, at patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost Podcast. And, you know, help help keep the lights on for the show. We appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Talk to you soon. Good evening.
Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. Find us on all audio streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Find us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to check out one of these other videos right here for more content on our favorite films and breaking down all kinds of movie content. Thanks so much.